Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and today I'm going to talk about Ready Player One. When it comes to Steven Spielberg, there's the Steven Spielberg we have, and I guess the Steven Spielberg we want, which is usually the Steven Spielberg we remember. The one who gave us Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. and Jaws. That kind of unmistakable, propulsive, memorable, cinematic energy that we just simply couldn't deny. Not to say that's gone, or gone completely, he's still a very good director. He's still one of the best directors we have around. As much as Spielberg has made himself more respectable, he made Schindler's List, he made Saving Private Ryan, he's made The Post, he's made films that he wants to make more mature subject matter, films that will get the respect of people and Oscar nominations and more serious fare, using his cinematic gifts to tell more quote-unquote important stories, I guess. Even though most of us and most of what he will forever be known for is Jaws and Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. and all the fun stuff, you know. And I think we're always hoping he will go back to that, that suddenly he'll pop out a new one that will go right in that world. He makes films that are very populous, that are very digestible, but I don't think he really makes a film that's for us the audience as much as he makes films that are for him and i think ready player one is probably the one where he does that now he's known to sometimes make a film because he knows it'll be a hit jurassic park was literally that's one of the main reasons he did it because he knew it would be a big hit i mean you know dinosaur theme park seems like a cool idea right and ready player one feels like that with jurassic park he's good enough of a director and had enough love and skill within Jurassic Park kind of have that kind of similar energy of his earlier works. Not as good, frankly, but it has a similar energy to it. Ready Player One feels different. He still knows how to make an amazing, incredible action sequence or a set piece, really. He knows how to use CG, which we've known for a while now. He knows how to structure a story, how to make a mainstream movie. He knows that so well it's ridiculous how well he can do that. It almost feels like he's doing it on autopilot at this point. That even works better than most people's structures. He knows how to pull you in and mold you as an audience member better than most directors could ever dream of. And him not being as into it is a much different feel. Think of the direction in this and the direction in the post. It's so different or even something like Tintin. Tintin was an audience movie. It's made to be a blockbuster. It's made to be consumed by a lot of people, but he made that on his terms. Like Steven Spielberg wanted to make Tintin. I'm not saying he didn't. He wasn't forced into this. No one's going to force Steven Spielberg to do very much of anything, but Ready Player One feels like he made it more for us to stay possibly culturally relevant, to have a big hit, and he knew, honestly, he could do it and it would be fine and the audience would love it. Even the cultural references aren't like his cultural references. And I know he's sort of experimenting with newer, semi-newer <laughs> kind of film language and so forth. He's working on films that are more influenced by films of his contemporaries of his own era when he was making films like The Post using 70s filmmaking particularly in that one and in this using films from the 80s and 90s and kind of feeling more in the modern blockbuster vein. It's interesting to see him do this. I think the only real reference I could identify that was more of something that he was definitely into was the War of the World reference which didn't feel like something someone from the 80s would be that into and some of the references in this I know this is supposed to be the big nostalgia movie felt like someone who knew what these things were and how populous they could be but didn't come at it from a place of love you know he's the guy who produced who framed roger rabbit and had a lot to do with getting all those licenses and getting as many characters as he could and this it didn't feel like he really did that as much now certainly both Roger Rabbit and this, you kind of are stuck with whatever the home studio for that film is. You're going to be overwhelmed with mostly their IP. But I think for the most part, the characters were interesting, but it did feel like someone who maybe knew who these characters were and kind of asked his friends, kids, if they would like certain things in a movie. But it didn't feel like the ones of his. And there's kind of like this sort of division in this film. Now, I think Raider Player One is really about uh, escapism and not and realizing you know there's more to just escaping from your reality you need to face your reality and deal with the real life and things of that nature I don't know if it 
really dwells in the real life and reality portion of it enough but it's interesting that a film that is about escaping and being removed from something is directed with such a sense of remove from it you know you can tell it's weird because i i i think most video game movies are mostly directed by people who are you know it's their first or second or third film or so forth they're a younger director they're newer with newer film language most of their film language has actually come primarily from video games not saying steven spielberg you know doesn't game bro or something like that i think he does you can tell his visual language is different and it's interesting to have like you know the blockbuster director of all blockbuster directors uh directing a film that is essentially you know a video game movie mainly about vr and this oasis thing and he manages to still understand visual set pieces and the you know the control you need to have and how you know camera is so crisp and clear and you can tell exactly what's going on while still having like tons of chaos he both feels like the producer of all those transformers movies which he doesn't like to talk about but he definitely is and also you know the great director steven spielberg at the same time like it makes you sort of wish he directed transformers movies but please never do that steven spielberg that would be awful it is a film that really deals with the idea of like your life and let that be the only thing you should experience life and it does feel like maybe a director who's mainly spent his life like watching tons of movies in a dark room kind of say hey maybe there's more to life than all this stuff at the same time it feels like someone who understands how you are removed from that but he also feels like he understands he's removed from a lot of what he's presenting to you. It's odd to watch the flow of this film. I think it's a movie that I think it was a lot more compelling than like, I don't know, was it like Tomb Raider and Pacific Rim 2, which I both saw recently. And towards the end, I was a little not as into them. This, like, I was still with it. I was into it as an audience member. I could feel getting kind of whisked away in that Spielberg way. And he like definitely knows how to do that incredibly well. It definitely did feel like he got it he understood that this movie was going to be big he understood he needed to use certain references and things but it felt like very calculated it almost honestly felt more like a steven spielberg produced film than a steven spielberg directed film in terms of like the reference heaviness it feels like something that joe dante or zemeckis would do not as much spielberg usually but it felt like he was kind of filtering it out more picking the action uh, set piece and the thrillingness of it over just having a ton of references even though this film still has a ton of references in it it's like it's like pretty overbearing with all the references there's certain sequences like the opening the first like kind of car chase scene is incredible there's a a scene that happens in the Overlook Hotel in The Shining, which is another thing that's interesting because Steven Spielberg is like famous for doing interviews about Stanley Kubrick, talking about how he never really liked The Shining, and he still does one of the greatest homages I've seen of The Shining potentially ever. And some shots of it felt like right out of The Shining, like I honestly gasped. I thought they did, he did an amazing job with that. It was kind of interesting how much he played within the lore of The Shining and everything like that. It was a really thrilling kind of spooky sequence. It probably spoke more to how good of a director he is at doing these set pieces and how he can like mess with the tone of the movie while still being appropriate in that. It's just frankly amazing. Like there's so much about his direction even in this that like I think he was more on point in the post but it still shows how good he is that I just want to see him kind of do this in a different way. It almost felt like he went like, you know, Stranger Things is influenced by me. Most of the world is influenced by me. Why don't I see what it's like to play with all these influences, but not play with the influence of himself, which I think is a wasted opportunity. They have a whole sequence about Atari, and I'm like, so you're not bringing up the E.T. thing, huh? You're just not going to bring it up. It's like right there, dude. You don't even have to do a reference to your exact movie. I know you probably like collected a check for that thing and felt sort of bad when they were like, oh, everybody lost their jobs. Could you give us the check back? And he was like, no, sorry. I didn't know this game was going to be a industry leveling disaster. It would have been nice to see him play more with his own stuff. I think in some ways, as much as this is us wanting him to go back and wanting him to be this director, wanting him to be this fun blockbuster thing. He doesn't indulge us as much. He indulges us that he showed up and he did this and he gave us these amazing sequences and he did the kind of Spielberg thing. He gave us the kind of typical kind of end sequence that we want and everything like that. But he's not going to have, you know, Bruce the shark or whatever you want to call the shark from Jaws, you know, swim by or something. You're not going to see Indiana Jones or they tried to get close encounters. That was like the one thing they apparently were actually 
actually going to do. I keep reading he didn't want to do that because of 1941, uh, paid homages to his other films like Duel and so forth. I think he should have maybe just uh, gone for it, although he does reference Back to the Future, which he was a big producer on. Um, I, I think, you know, he cast this film well, as most Steven Spielberg films are, he actually cast this well, although Ben Mendelsohn is typically playing the Ben Mendelsohn role, he's very good at it, despite all the sexual harassment allegations and so forth, I actually thought T.J. Miller was better in this, to be honest. Um, Tyler, Ty Sheridan, I, I noticed this has gotten, like, worse as he's gotten older, but I still thought he was fine, but he's just kind of, like, very milk toast. It felt like I think Steven Spielberg maybe should have gone with him, maybe a little bit more of a compelling lead for this. Um, and I liked uh, Lena Waithe. I thought she was actually really good as, uh, as H. Mark Rylance is kind of, like, a little off, but off in an interesting kind of way that you kind of get where he's going. He kind of plays off of the whole movie in a certain way, which reminds you how great of an actor he is, but it's more of an interesting performance than one of, you know, his more amazing ones that you saw in Bridge of Spies or Dunkirk or so forth. Simon Pegg was weird that he had an American accent in this. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but it was Simon Pegg was in this. You know, I think, you know, everyone probably wants to go, this is a nostalgia trip and this is about bullshit movie. And, you know, there's certain nostalgia things like the holy hand grenade I thought was a, a clever uh, reference. And there's certain references I thought were cool and there are others that made me groan. And But I don't think this is just a nostalgia trip, but I think what this is is seeing an older kind of prize director kind of trying to reclaim and almost like go back and make be a blockbuster director in ways that he normally isn't you know and try to do it on our terms rather than his but it kind of makes you understand the greatness of Spielberg wasn't that he could just do all these amazing sequences and set pieces and I think this kind of shows the emptiness of when he's not fully into something with the posts like he really wanted the camera to move around and do all these things and make that subject matter come to life and this didn't feel like he was like bringing it to life it felt like he was just kind of going through the motions and knew how to deliver it to you one of the most amazing things about E.T. and that ending where the music's going crazy is there's a real sense that he is confident enough that he does not care if you like that movie, which is kind of a weird thing to say about E.T. because you think through most of it, like he probably does care. And, and I, I disagree with that, particularly with that in Raiders. It's like the direction's so good, the scenes are so well put together. It's so well composed. There's such a confidence in there that he is so much himself. If you're not able to meet him halfway, then he's not interested in meeting you at all. And, and I think that's one of the great things about Spielberg is, but he's so digestible and cinematic and inviting and exciting that you want to go with him on that and you want to fall in love with that. And Ready Player One doesn't have that passion behind it. It just has the technical aspect of Spielberg, which is something that people have accused him of ever since he was a younger filmmaker, that he's more of a technical filmmaker than a filmmaker with a heart, than a filmmaker that can do things with actors. And I don't necessarily want to go that far with it, but this felt his most removed. This felt the kind of film that everyone thought he would make, probably not in, in the 70s because of the subject matter and technology and whatnot, but the kind of basic idea of this kind of movie is something that people thought he would do at the time. As much as I like him kind of on autopilot and think that is an interesting thing to watch, I don't think this is like a great movie. It's sort of like fine. I kind of would prefer a War of the Worlds, which I was never as into, or any of his kind of like lesser movies on the lower end of the spectrum of his filmography, but there's still like, most of those are better than most filmmakers' entire filmographies. And this was a really thrilling, well-made, well put together big Hollywood movie. I know people are like, sort of like against this movie and say it's stupid and do we need all these references? It's just using all that to be this big nostalgia trip that people will fall for. I mean, yeah, but I think he makes it good enough that you'll have a compelling enough of a time that you won't leave like completely disappointed. I think you'd leave kind of entertained like a good Hollywood film would, but not a good Hollywood film that will make you fall in love with the movies. It's kind of a good Hollywood film that makes you have kind of faith in Hollywood as a system they can just make this kind of digestible escapist kind of fair and I think the thing about Ready Player One is as much as it says it is kind of trying to make you appreciate and think about breaking away from you know gaming or movies or whatever and understanding that escapism and running away from your problems is not the ultimate solution 
it is very much a product of that and it doesn't break from that <laughs> you know there's never a point where it makes you really deal with that there's like a few scenes or whatever and they're in real life and stuff but like in all actuality this narrative is more about the adventure and the chase than dealing with any of those actual problems it's pretending they're a resolution at the end in the way that narrative is supposed to work i don't think ready player one really sells that kind of ending and that kind of like exclamation point that it's acting like is an exclamation point when it's like barely a comma i think ready player one is fun and it's a fun movie and you'll have a lot of fun with it but it doesn't level you and make you think about why you were escaping and what you are missing out by escaping it. It is making you feel complacent in its escapist fantasy and fine with this escapist fantasy and directed by a guy who's more known for that kind of beautiful escapist entertainment more than anybody. Ready Player One kind of just lays it out and just is fine with sort of being that escapist fantasy and giving you the thing to not think about you know your shitty day at work or your shitty week at work and sort of kind of just enjoy that weekend that you don't want to waste that's what it is it's there to have a cold beer with and not think too much about and not think about why you need that escapism to not deal with the boring horrible dystopian real world that you live in and in that way it's sort of interesting to see escapist entertainment try to say something morally about how maybe there's more to life than escapist entertainment itself but it's kind of just showing you that moral thing at the end because it legally has to not making you as a viewer actually deal with it because it's not actually going to deal with it so if you have seen ready player one and you would like to talk about it then comment below in the comments and subscribe if you would like to Thank you.